Thank you very much for the invitation, Anton. Uh, it's nice to be here with you again for those that uh, uh, were in the course that we, we gave. And pleasure and nice to meet you for those that uh, we are seeing for the first time. Well, the paper I'm presenting here is actually a, a work in progress, but as I told to Anton, we're already submitting the, uh, we submitted. Uh, but as we see, and I'll try to be a little bit fast in the beginning to make sure that we'll get to the end, but I'm not sure. But uh, as you see, it's more like a tool to analyze other things. Of course, that we have some results from this, but uh, the idea is to use these as a generic tool where you can analyze. In the end, we'll, we'll talk a little bit on this, but for example, the European uh, countries are introducing or trying, there is a discussion between France and Germany, uh, introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, which is basically trying to charge uh, the imports as they charge the, uh, the domestic production based on the carbon intensity of the products. Uh, I, we think that this tool that we're I'm presenting here will be very useful to understand the consequence of this type of measures, these changes in scenarios, these uh, policies uh, that take place in countries uh, to promote the low carbon or the green transition. Uh, uh, in this paper, is like I will try to present the tools and also some applications, very preliminary applica applications, but uh, if we have if we time, I'll try to show very specific applications that are very interesting because you can see the impact of uh, these policies on, especially on developing countries. So it's more focused, most of you here, not most of you, but some of you come from developing countries. And you know that the difference between uh, the problems that the developing country face and the problems, especially in the macroeconomic field, uh, developed country face is completely different. And the idea here is to look at developing countries because we believe that these tools should be more used for, an, uh, uh, we, sh we need more uh, economic tools to analyze the macroeconomic dynamics of developing countries because most of the models that we have are focused on developed countries. Uh, there, are, oh, there is only my name here, but this paper is a joint work with all the GEMS team at the FG. So we have Antoine, Etienne, uh, Achilles, De Vrin together. Uh, probably for those who, had, who did the course know them. Uh, but the idea, I will, okay. Uh, first I will present the concept of framework of the paper to introduce to you what's the main issues that we are trying to address the difference between exposure, vulnerability, and risk, uh, the different dimensions that we are trying to understand because uh, these exposure, vulnerability, and risk, they have different dimensions that we are looking at. So you have the external dimension, which is focused more on the balance of payment constraints that can emerge, fiscal, which is generically what the World Bank is always talking about, uh, and the socioeconomic, which is something that's very new in economics, actually. Uh, for you, it's very, it doesn't seem to be new because probably you're seeing a lot, but it's, very, it's something that is not very well established in economics yet. And then uh, we are going to the industries that you call sunset industries, trying to understand what are the industries that will decline. <laughs> and of course, because there are some industries that will emerge and other industries will decline with the low carbon transition. And the idea of the paper is trying to understand if the countries depend on these industries, if the developing countries depend on these industries, the sunset industries, they will face a lot of problems. And then we're moving to the counter analysis and I will show more detail the, the tools that we're developing with, uh, uh, basically how we are looking at these. And then you have these Comparative analysis, like looking at countries in different places, uh, different conditions, trying to understand a little bit the different dimensions of exposure because most of the works in economics tries to create a synthetic index that say, okay, this is the most exposed countries because they have all these uh, these problems together, like they, they face fiscal problems. They, but the thing is like uh, what we're trying to see here, and this is something that's, I, I believe at least, is very relevant for developing countries, is that sometimes the different dimensions are relevant. You have to look at the different dimensions and consider, for example, uh, if a country is facing fiscal problems, uh, uh, 
it will have some impact. If they are facing external balance of payment problems, you, you have a different impact. And depending on the structure of the countries, some problems will be more relevant than, than the others. So it's interesting to see the different dimensions and not try to consolidate in a simple index like uh, all these, these famous institutions try to, to say, like uh, uh, transparency <laughs> index. They, they try to create these generic algorithms to to consolidate in one dimension everything together, but our approach is try, at least we try to, uh, is always trying to look at different dimensions. And of course, it's much more complicated, but at least we believe that it's much more valuable for, for the economic theory. Well, the basic idea of this paper goes a little bit on the notion that the low carbon transition or the ecological transition, if you go beyond and think not only that the transition is focused on car uh, carbon intensity, even though uh, for until now, uh, most of the measures, most of the discussion is based on the low carbon transition. But the low carbon transition, or more broadly, the ecological transition, the green transition, is a process of structural change, rapid structural change, uh, like, like we have many others in the, uh, in the history of the, economy, the capitalism, like uh, you had the first industrial revolution where some industries emerge, uh, like textiles and footwear, and then you have the second revo industrial revolution where some other industries emerge, and those industries that were important before uh, lost importance and then they, they, they decline. Uh, the third industrial revolution, the, doesn't need to be industrial revolution, but it will have like a, the, uh, in the discussion that we did in the pod class, we talk about like different paradigms, techno-economic paradigms, but the idea is that this structural change, this rapid structural change, is not led by technological change purely, but is mostly led by policy. Uh, and basically, what you have, like uh, some countries are pushing for, towards like this low carbon transition and technology will be important, of course, change in preference will be important, but policy is the main issue here. And because po countries are putting forward, the, uh, they are very interested in putting forward this low carbon transition, some structural change will happen in all the other economies. Basically, uh, the countries that depend, as I, seen, I was saying at the very beginning, the countries that depend, uh, of course we have to look at all the interrelated between sectors, but the countries that depend the most on these declining industries, the sunset industries, those industries that are losing parts, for example, the classic one is the fossil fuels in fossil fuel industry. Uh, once you are like starting having uh, solar or wind uh, energy, uh, uh, energy from solar or wind sources, uh, the fossil fuel as a source of energy will drop. These industries that are declining, and of course there, is not, there are many others, uh, we're talking about the CBAN, the carbon border adjustment in Europe, uh, the, it's focused on aluminum, it's focused on cement, other industries that are also very relevant. Uh, the, the, the dependence, the, the higher is the dependence that countries has in relation to these industries, uh, the higher will be the uh, impact of this uh, low carbon transition in these countries. And the idea is the, of the paper is to look at different dimensions of these impacts. Well, basically, countries to put forward this transition, they will need a lot of foreign currency. Why? Let's imagine a country like, uh, I don't know, a developing country that does not produce all the uh, machineries necessary to produce solar uh, photovoltaic energy, which is something that's gonna, uh, probably is going to be very important in the next few years. Well, they have to import this if they want to move towards the low carbon transition. They had to stop producing the energy like from coal. South Africa, for example, is a very important producer of energy from coal. And they have to import most of the machinery, equipments, and inputs to produce these goods, this low carbon uh, energy source, no carbon source of energy. Well, you need to export more to import more. It's a, it's a, uh, you can, of course, you can finance it uh, with external debt and everything, but 
you need to export more. Otherwise, we start with, we, we enter or you trigger a balance of payment constraint. You cannot move towards these industries because you cannot import the goods necessary to produce this, uh, these low carbon energy uh, or low carbon products. And then you need to import more. And the thing is like, okay, for these countries, those countries that need, uh, de depend on the exports of these products, the fossil fuel, cement, aluminum, iron steel, I don't know, like meat. Sometimes meat is uh, considered like a uh, sunset industry as, and there will be some enforcement to change from meat to other sorts of food. Well, if the countries depend on these industries, they have two problems. And one problem is that their exports are reducing and the other problem is that the imports are increasing because now we, they need to import to, to, to make this, the transition. So you have a balance of payment or external uh, problem here. Well, fiscal. Another thing is the fiscal issues. Like, uh, of course, like, um, even if you're thinking, okay, countries can finance themselves, emitting currents, but they need source of, uh, they need to, there are some sectors that are very important to, uh, to increase the revenues, the fiscal revenues, to generate fiscal revenues. And you need to invest a lot to move towards these other sectors, these low carbon energy sectors, low carbon uh, emission sectors. Why? Because you need to invest in infrastructure, you need to, the social system, you need to invest a lot of, because there will be a lot of people who will be unemployed. Uh, and then there will be a very important fiscal cost and if you depend on these industries, and this is the case, for example, um, some uh, Latin American countries, they depend a lot on the fiscal revenues from oil. Uh, if the, you depend a lot on fiscal revenues from oil exports, maybe you have a problem here because the, the price of oil tends to drop or you tend to not find some, <coughs> the demand for, for oil will drop. And then the fiscal revenue probably will be reduced because of this. And then this is another problem that we have to look at. And finally, going a little bit on the things that were just said about the employment, uh, the social economic conditions need to be stable for the transition. You cannot just generate in unemployment for like half of the population just advocating for a low carbon transition. It has to be some kind of, and if the uh, half of their population works directly or indirectly uh, in these industries, indirectly, for example, produce inputs, services, which depend on these industries to, to be produced. And uh, basically, you're generating a lot of unemployment, and, and especially uh, if these employments are the well-paid jobs in the country, the social problem will be even higher. So we have to look at, at least these three aspects, which is very specific for developing countries. Usually for developed countries, we're looking at financial aspects, uh, which is also relevant for developing countries. But, but here, at least we are looking at these three specific ones because they are specifically interesting from the point of view that uh, we are trying to address this, uh, this extremely important for developing countries. Well, what is, uh, what do we call exposure? What do you call risk and vulnerabilities? Basically, uh, if the country depends on the sunset industries, they will be very exposed. So for example, China. China is a country we see that uh, depends a lot on the exports of uh, some industries that con are considered sunset industries. So China can be a very exposed country. Does it mean that China will have problems with the low carbon transition. Not necessary. Why? Because depending on the conditions, for example, in the case of China, uh, they were, uh, balance of payment doesn't seem to me, at least, doesn't seem to be a problem for China. They have like half of the reserves in the world, I don't know. But they can pay for the imports easily. So the, the, you have to look at a little bit further to understand what is a vulnerability. A country that has a very high debt, in external debt, is very indebted. If they have a balance of payment crisis or, or a drop in exports generated by the high exposure, they will, be, they will face much more problems than China, for example. And you have to look at also, from a dynamic perspective, 
the capacity of the country to adapt to these new technologies. Uh, for example, again, China. China is a country that produces a lot of green products. Uh, and they have potential to produce a lot of the green products. For example, machinery to produce energy from solar, solar and energy, uh, photo photovoltaic energy. Well, China is a very important producer of these machineries. So China can move easily from the, these industries like aluminum, iron and steel, to, uh, to these other industries. The same is Korea. For Korea, it's like um, maybe Korea is a country with very high exposure, a little bit of vulnerability because they don't have as uh, so much reserves as China has, but they can move easily to these other products. So we are differentiating here like different. Here is a picture of the country. Basically, that's what we are going to focus on this paper. Here is looking at, okay, a picture compared to the other things that the country has. And here is more like a movie, like how the country can move to other products, can adapt the, their production system. So that's basically the framework that I want to present to you because basically we're talking here about exposure and talk a little bit on vulnerability, for example, when we're talking about social protection. Social protection, a country that lost a lot of jobs uh, green, uh, the sunset industry's job, but they have some social protection, is in a but much better situation than a country that you, you lost all these jobs and they don't have even a social protection system. So you have to look at different variables to understand these. Well, and it's, yeah, it's another color, but the <laughs> same. Yeah, here's the variables. Uh, I'll not go through these very detail, but uh, basically we're looking at the uh, dependence, which is basically looking at the exposure. And you're uh, for the external exposure, we're looking at the capacity of the sectors, the importance of the sectors to generate foreign currency. But it's net generation of foreign currency because you have to discount the imports necessary to produce these products. So for example, uh, like uh, the maquilas in Mexico, it's a very famous, or in, basically they are exporting cars to the US, but they import a lot of inputs to produce these cars. So we are considering only the, the difference between like the, the exports minus the imports necessary. Why? Because what is the raise of foreign currency from, exports, uh, from the exports of cars? Basically, is the additional things that you, the additional value that you, the value added, that's why, the value added that Mexico is, uh, is adding, I don't know, the, the value that Mexico is adding, the value that Mexico is adding through these cars, in these cars. So they need to import and then they export. The difference is the raise of foreign currency. And this is what we look at when we're talking about the external uh, dependence or the external exposure. When we're looking at the fiscal exposure, we're looking at the importance of sunset industries to raise tax revenue. And we are considering here direct and indirect. Why? What is the indirect? Basically, it's the supply of inputs within the country, of course, that is necessary to produce these goods. So basically, uh, when I'm producing, I don't know, fossil fuels, uh, I'm using a lot of inputs, not so much, but <laughs> some inputs, uh, and aluminum. Aluminum, we use a lot of inputs. We use electricity, <laughs> we use... Uh, Iron, I don't know how to produce aluminum. No, use aluminum. <laughs> it's like a, to produce the, uh, the rows of aluminum, you use a lot of other stuff. Okay, these other stuffs, these inputs, are also important as a fiscal revenue. We, are not on, we cannot only consider the importance of those that are the final product. And because you are using here multi regional input output matrices, I don't know if you know the notion of input-output matrix, but the idea of input-output matrix is, is to look exactly through these indirect inputs, so the inputs necessary to produce each good. And because you're using the multi-regional in, uh, input-output tables, what we have here is sometimes that there is a cross-country interrelation when we're talking about these indirect impacts. For example, uh, Brazil exports iron to China, that produce uh, uh, vehicles that are not electric. If vehicles that are not electric, uh, full propensity uh, vehicles, are, uh, are a sunset industry, is a sunset industry, basically Brazil will be indirectly impacted 
Why? Because they are producing iron, which is like a very heavy car. Uh, and now the new cars are, for example, by plastic. I don't know, or by paper, <laughs> or by, by glass fiber. Uh, and then Brazil will be impacted indirectly, even though they are not exporting the product that we're focused on. We're focused on cars, but Brazil is exporting to China uh, iron to produce these cars. But we are accounting for this. So the iron that Brazil exports, in, direct, in, in, in the case of iron, because it's a sunset, it is a little bit more complicated, but the, the products that we're exporting, and they are being processed, and then they uh, they are being processed to produce sunset products or uh, produce, produced by sunset industry. They need to be accounted. And they also need to be accounted when you are talking about socioeconomic exposure. Because you are generating, you are reducing fiscal revenue, of course, that's something that we are looking. But you are generating unemployment in these industries and you are generating, like, uh, you're reducing the wage bill or the wage paid for the, for the producers of the employers in these industries. And then we are looking at this whole thing like to try to understand what is the external dependence. And then we suggest some variables here to analyze the sensitivity, like uh, we're talking about like external constraints, so reserves, external debt, uh, fiscal constraints, public debt, deficit, long-term interest rates. You have different variables that you can look at this. The socioeconomic, like uh, inequalities in the country, a country with higher inequality will be more vulnerable to the socioeconomic impacts of the low carbon transition, uh, protection cover, as I was saying, and of course, the capacity to move to another industries. And I will go th through this a little bit in, uh, in a few minutes. But uh, there are some very recent techniques trying to measure these capabilities, the ca uh, capacity of the countries to move from one industry to another based on what they are producing now. It's always the thing more complicated to talk about. Well, this graph, I think it's interesting because it shows a little bit of, uh, we're trying to identify what are the sunset industries. And again, we use input-output matrices to calculate what is the CO2 emission intensity, CO2 equivalent emission intensity by sector, considering the sector itself and the inputs embodied in the sector. So it's like uh, we're talking about the car that China is producing. We are also cons considering the, uh, the emission of the iron producing in Brazil that, that's needed to produce the, for example, the South Africa energy. Uh, if you're producing aluminum in South Africa and, you, and using electricity from coal, or, which is something that Kamal can say after us if it is true or not, but uh, uh, it's something that Africa, South Africa uh, use a lot, they, they use coal for producing electricity, then the electricity embodied in the aluminum production is also accounted here. And then you have some industries here that these are the these three are the industries with the higher CO2 emission intensity. This is the distribution cross countries. So you have 189 countries in this database. Uh, the, the, after I will show you the, another database that shows the sector much more disaggregated and granulated data. It's much more interesting. But at least we have like at least these three, sorry, this, no, we have few industries here that are very emission intensive. Uh, just a second. Uh, my computer will restart and I cannot in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to do. Because <laughs> I'm. Uh, yeah, I think I would do this. Uh, because, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Well, and that comes. Back to this, yeah, these are the indus, okay, I will email, and then <laughs> I cannot do this at the same time. What's her email? Come on, what's her email? I oh, know, but I don't have internet here. I have to send from the. Uh, <laughs> okay. Let's put it in. Okay. We have five, 15 minutes. So well, uh, and besides. Okay, yeah. product by product and then 
What you have in this input-output matrix is that uh, given the production of the sector in each country, we have the pr total production and the total use, uh, total CO2 emission by product, by, by sector. Uh, and then one divided by the other is the, uh, the direct emissions. And then using the input-output matrices, we know uh, what are the inputs necessary to produce this product by product. So it's like uh, to produce a car, I need... Uh, I don't know, 10 kilos of uh, uh, glass, 50 kilos of aluminum. And then we have, for each of these industries, the CO2 emission intensity. And then we have the CO2 emission intensity directly, uh, directly embodied in the, those that are embodied in inputs. I don't know if it is, that's the idea. And it's not only the direct inputs, but also the indirect inputs. So like uh, pr to produce a car, I need glass, but to produce glass, I need sand. And to produce a car, I need aluminum. To produce aluminum, I need electricity. So the indirect, like uh, all the value chain. So and this competition is, uh, is done at the AFD, or these are like public? Uh, it's public done at AF AFD, we do, we do okay. but it's like, uh, yeah, it's actually, it's a very simple thing. Like, uh, just have to, the, the matrices are the hardest part to have these matrices, like, okay. yeah. Okay. So you have um, <coughs> like a, a sectorial, a sectorial uh, CO2 carbon emission per dollar, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Transaction by sector. Yeah, per dollar. Yeah, per dollar. It's uh, uh, it's not yeah, it's not clear here, sir. Uh, yeah, it's per dollar. Yeah, it's kilograms per it's kilograms of CO2 per dollar. Yeah, <coughs> which is about one. Yeah, this is actually. Yeah, this is one kilogram of CO2 per dollar. Yeah, I forgot to put the, <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, yeah, we have 10 minutes. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, this is okay. This is the yeah. This is the backward linkages. We're looking at the industries that are like the uh, the CO two em emission of the sector and the uh, emissions embodied in the sector. And you can also look at uh, for understanding the uh, if it is a sunset industries or a sunset industries or industry or not. For the forward, the downstream CO two emissions. So uh, the goods producing in mining and querying which is like most of them, and then we'll see that uh, the difference becomes very interesting when you are going through, through products. But let's imagine that here we have petroleum. Petroleum, to produce petroleum, the emission is not very relevant. It's relevant, but the, the most important problem with petroleum is that the way you're using petroleum, or coal, the way you're using coal, so it's not the emission of the sector itself, but it's the downward emission. Like uh, you're producing and then you are like, and basically there is discussion on scope one and two and three emissions. And this is something that we're looking at. So a petroleum, a, to produce petroleum don't have like so much emissions, but the process of use of petroleum is very emitting. Uh, just a short question. Why, what is the rationale behind putting mining and querying in the same category? Uh, there is no rationale. <laughs> the thing is, like, is the sector with because this is a matrix of 26 sectors, mm -hmm. and then we are going. In the end, I will present a new one that we are working now, which is a matrix of 163 sectors, and then there you have like extraction of petroleum, extraction of coal, extraction of like because here we have like everything together. Like, uh, yeah, I think the worst is not even not even these querying because like here you have petroleum. It's refined petroleum, actually. It's not the petroleum. All chemicals and non-metal, non-metallic mineral products. So glass, sand, cement, everything is together there. So it's a little bit more complicated. This sector, this big sector, is like complicated. But yeah, but I will show also the the other thing that we are doing because it's possible to do like using the trade data. Uh, it's possible to identify specifically products that are emitting, and then we see the importance of these products within these industries. Well, and here, what I did is like, yeah, 
basically you have low, medium, and high downstream emissions, and <laughs> you have low, medium, and high upstream emissions. So it's like when it's looking at the production of the product and what is embodied in the product, so it's like the upstream, and the other is looking at the use of the product. And mining and querying, which is like a very problematic because they have a lot of things together, it's a very important downstream emission sector. Uh, metal products, recycling, of course, uh, and chemicals are very important uh, downstream emissions. But of course, we're not considering recycling as a sunset industry because recycling is replacing industries that are emitting much more, or even worse than emitting. They use a lot of the, uh, bio, uh, they destroy the biodiversity. So recycling, is, even though the recycling is a very emitting industry, we cannot consider it as a sunset industry. So here we have to use go beyond the data, we have to use some kind of uh, basic knowledge, you know, because, but the problem with recycling is that the recycling process has to reduce the emission intensity if the countries want to use recycling to replace the other products. And then we define these four industries as the potential sunset industries, which means that the sunset industries are within these industries, but because of the sectoral aggregation, which is definitely a problem. We cannot s look at the data and say which one, of the, we, what products are within this industry. For example, metal products. We have here all the metallurgical, uh, the hard metallurgical industry. So we have aluminum, we have iron and steel, but we also have like metallic tools, like keys. This thing is metal. It's produced, but it cannot say that keys will be not sensitive. Uh, Maybe they will, not, because uh, basically we're not going to use keys anymore. We have like the cell phones. But anyway, like, uh, uh, and unfortunately, like everything is together. But we have some possible ways, and this is something that we are working on. You have some possible ways to reduce this error that is embodied. <coughs> well, going a little bit further through the, I have no. Uh, just 30 minutes. Sorry? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it's okay. It's okay, okay. Yeah, now it's like more showing the results, and then the, the, I think the most important, was, most important point was the, the framework, because it, this is something that we need to understand too. Because the most, as I told you, like the most important thing with this is the tool. More important than the results, at least, I think, is the tool that we, we are developing to understand. So here is the external risks divided by if even each one of these products. So for example, Algeria is the one that's more vulnerable. Uh, sorry, more, ex uh, uh, sorry, it's not risk. It's m the one that's more uh, exposed because it depends a lot on this mining and query industry. Basically, Algeria is a very important exporter of oil, like refined and non-refined oil, most of the crude oil, actually. Kuwait, Angola, Iraq, Libya, Venezuela, and New Caledonia, Russia, you have a lot of countries here. We can go through these countries and discuss then each one and the, the paper try to do this. But the thing I want to stress here is that if you look at this, basically we're seeing that mining and querying is the main important sector here as the determinant of the external dependence, which is somewhat logic because uh, most of these countries that export fossil fuels or iron and steel, or like, st <laughs> um, actually iron and steel is in metal products, but uh, iron ores are here in mining and querying. So the countries that are exporting these products, my, uh, iron ores, they are in this blue part. Uh, chemicals are very important for some countries, because like here in chemicals you have uh, refined petroleum, but also because you have uh, uh, cement, that's something that actually cement is a little bit more complicated because it's very, it's very it's one of the most important emitting industries, but uh, the exports of the cement is not that relevant. Uh, and wooden paper is not very relevant, as said by Cameroon. And, but it's see that in general is the mining and querying is the sector that determines these. And you look at if you look at the, sorry for the, if you're not seeing the uh, small errors here, <laughs> but if Basically, we're looking here is this estimation that we did, the net raise of foreign currency in this vertical axis, and the green complexity potential, which is a measure of the capacity of the countries to adapt to green industries in this 
horizontal axis. So basically, we have here those uh, set by the green points, which is a control that we use to avoid taking the, because of the, the level of aggregation. We cannot say that for, uh, all counters here are uh, producing sunset industries because they can produce, for example, copper, which is not a very sunset industry, even though it's in mining. Uh, but all these counters here, especially these ones, are those that they are very exposed and they are in risk. Why? Because they cannot adapt the production to, uh, to these new industries. Those that are here, for example, Russia, Norway, Colombia, South Africa, uh, what happens is that they are very exposed, but they have the capabilities, they are much, in much better condition compared to the rest, of course. Like, I'm not saying that, okay, they can easily move, but they are much, in a much better condition than uh, Angola and Algeria. Or even, uh, I don't know, Azerbaijan, which is here. I, I, try, I was trying to find one that I know. <laughs> yeah, and of course, there are these countries here, the, all these countries here, that they are in a much better situation, even though some of them uh, are very dependent on these industries, these sunset industries in, in external terms, they can easily adapt. Like you have France, Spain, Italy, Poland, Poland India, China. China is actually the top one in the Green Potential Index. Uh, well, besides the external, we have the fiscal. And the fiscal, it's interesting because it changes the color. We are using the same, same industries. We're adding the all industries indirect because now we have the indirect impacts. In the external, we don't have the indirect impacts. We have only the direct, subtracted by the minus the, the imported content of these exports. So to have the net and uh, not the, the gross exports, uh, raise of foreign currency actually. And then here you have some countries that depend a lot because of the indirect, some countries that depend a lot of because of chemicals, and that's the problem here, you have a lot of things together, you have the refined petroleum, you have all the uh, fertilizers and everything is, is here. You have metal products, and uh, I would say, I don't know if you agree with him, but uh, it seems to me that these two industries here, of course, the indirect impact and the chemicals, which includes chemicals and non-mineral metals, they are the most important here. Uh, why? Because they are much more important for the production than for the exports. So countries are produce a lot of these goods, chemicals, these pro the products that are within these industries here, then they produce mining and query, but they export mining and query. So you have different dimensions, and that's why you have completely different, not completely, but you have a uh, much more interesting, not more interesting, you have different countries here. Yeah, you have like, for example, Bolivia, which is not, was not there, Paraguay, Ecuador, Korea, uh, Algeria was the top one there, it's only the, of course, here is only the, we have 189 countries, and here is like, 25% of these countries. Yeah. What is the bottom uh, scale, the 2040, uh, I have a problem with this, no, but uh, I should put the, <laughs> scale there, but it's the percentage of fiscal revenues from these industries. Okay, okay. So, so the, of the total fiscal revenue of the country, 60% uh, of the in Kuwait <coughs> comes from these industries. Basically, it's refined petroleum here, I think. If I should, if I guess, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I think it is. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Ah, you're just saying that Colombia is not here. <laughs> I don't know because this is only the 25% worst. I'm not saying that the Colombia doesn't have, but uh, if you look at these one. You see that it drops faster than this, right? It means that for most of the countries, it's much more relevant the fiscal revenue, the fiscal constraint, the fiscal exposure than the external exposure. But for those countries, that external exposure is very important. They are, it's very important because, like, it's 80 percent of the fiscal revenue, the uh, the external, the foreign currency revenue. I I don't know where, but Colombia is not very dependent on this industry. I think. Yeah, but even the external is not like, uh, I think Colombia is compared to the rest because we're talking about like countries that depend a lot on fossil fuels, on minerals like, 
but yeah, we can look at these after. Well, uh, here it's about the same, but the thing here is that, okay, we are looking at the, uh, uh, here you have the scale. <laughs> the tax revenue from Sunset Industries, so it's the same number that we are seeing before. I don't know if I can find Colombia here, but <laughs> now I want to. Okay, but basically you have the same countries, like Kuwait is the first and so on and so far. And here you have the production of Sunset Industries, which means that if you are here, or uh, in this situation here, is that you, are, you depend a lot on these industries in terms of production and in terms of tax revenue. So you cannot move to other products. But let's say that you are here, like Paraguay. Paraguay depends a lot on these industries in terms of tax revenue, but they have space to change the, if like, these industries start dropping and losing importance, Paraguay can more easily move to other sectors. Saudi Arabia is the same, Guyana. Uh, India, and here is India, it's interesting because this is the, again the GCP, which is the global complexity, green complexity potential. India is very blue here, actually it's well, one of the top 10 pro countries in terms of the potential they have to move to green industries. So India is a country that's extremely dependent on the sunset industries, like they export iron, uh, 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 aluminium, I think, but what happened with India is that uh, despite these, they can more easily, compared to the rest of the uh, Asian countries or even compared to the co African countries in general, they can more easily move to green industries. So dynamically, they are in a much better position, even though they are at some point exposed, they are not necessarily very vulnerable or in risk, right? And here is the socioeconomic. We have wages here, the importance of these industries in terms of paying wages, the summation of all these industries, and the importance in paying and generating employment. So the problem here is that these industries generate a lot of, um, especially here, like they, they generate a lot of employment, well-paid employment, because the wage in these industries are above the average. And here, what happens is that they generate a lot of employment, but low paid employment. So the socioeconomic uh, aspect is, has to consider not only the employment that you are generating, but the wage of these employers, because you are destroying like, low paid jobs, in the case of Laos, Liberia, and PNG, which I don't know, Papua Nova Guinea, Papua New Guinea. And, and here in China, Bolivia, Trinidad, Tobago, and Zimbabwe, in Ukraine, you are destroying the well-paid jobs. So that's something that we have to look at. And of course, the colors here are showing, like the bluest, the, the, the dark blue is the high social protection, and the red is the low social protection. Trinidad, Tobago, and Zimbabwe, they are almost in the same condition in terms of the dependence of these industries, uh, because like, uh, both depend a lot on these industries to pay, uh, to generate good, uh, well-paid jobs. But Trinidad Tobago has a much better social security system than Zimbabwe. I'm not saying the uh, social security system in, Z in Trinidad Tobago is the best, but compared to Zimbabwe, it's much better. And basically, this. And China and Bolivia, for example, is the same like, thing story. In China, is much better than Bolivia. And well, uh, here is like just another way of looking at the same thing. We select some countries here, Trinidad Tobago, some countries that always appearing as a very important one. And we have like different dimensions that we're looking at. Here we're looking at five dimensions, and the blue part is the direct, and the gray part is the, is the total, which is the indirect plus the direct. So the difference between them is the indirect, the gray part in the other graph. Uh, basically, we have some countries like Kuwait that depend a lot on these industries to generate foreign currency, pay wages, sorry, generate taxes and produce, but these industries are not important in terms of employment and wages. The other story is like, uh, I don't know, Ethiopia and Zimbabwe, these industries are very important in terms of paying wages and uh, generating employment, but they are not important in terms of foreign, generating foreign currency, raising foreign currency. And I don't know, Bolivia, Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago, they are important in all dimensions. So it's like, and based on these different dimensions, what we did, okay, just a second. What we did, I don't know why, there, I should, after 
But uh, what you did is to cluster countries within groups. So it's a multi-dimensional analysis. I'm not explaining on these, but uh, basically we have four clusters of countries based on these four different, these five different dimensions that we were talking before. And these countries are those that are very exposed countries in all dimensions. These two groups of countries, they have different kinds of exposure. These countries are more exposed in terms of uh, socioeconomic, and these countries are more exposed in terms of external, and these are the low exposed countries. Like each one of these countries are on one point, and then they are grouped uh, using cluster methods. And why do I know these? Because we see this distribution. So production. Like, uh, those countries that are in purple depends a lot of the sunset industries in terms of production. Actually, the purple countries are always in the right side in the distribution, which means that they are always more exposed. And then you have a switch here. If you look at the, uh, the red, I don't know, pink, red, <laughs> this color here, this red color, and the blue, here the red is beyond the blue, and in the rest, the blue is beyond the, especially in the socioeconomic which is looking at wages and employment. Uh, the blue is, uh, uh, is higher than the red, which means that the blue countries are those that depend, in terms of, depend on these industries in terms of wages, and the red countries are those that depend on these, these industries in terms of the foreign currency, raise of foreign currency, not raise of foreign currency. Uh, one thing that we're talking before, just going through this, uh, this is, we can look at specific industries within countries. I don't know why I took Gabon here, but I took Gabon, which is an interesting case. If you look at Gabon, this is the first thing that we look at, the net raise of foreign currency, and here is the tax, total tax contribution. It's clear that the sectors are different. The sectors that are important for taxation are different than the sectors that are important for foreign currency, raising foreign currency. And what happens that usually with countries that mining and querying, agriculture are more like important for foreign currency, raising foreign currency, while chemicals, food, uh, electric, education and health, these sectors, uh, they are more important for taxation. And then what we have is like, uh, we can go beyond the analysis of the sectors and to look, in, look into the, what are the sectors or the products that are determining each one of these of the uh, exposition, this multi-dimension exposition. Here is a map of all countries, which is basically showing which country Colombia is here. You can see that Colombia is here. It's a very stern of exposed countries, country. So probably in the graph, we, the first one we could find Colombia because it's a very stern of exposed country. Country, uh, but for example, Brazil depends on the, the, this industry mainly due to the socioeconomic aspects. I don't know, like uh, Canada is external, exposed. It doesn't mean that uh, Canada will face a lot of problems because Canada can move easily to other industries. The story that being exposed is different than being risky. And uh, Australia is the same. Are well, the sorry? The great? <laughs> the gray is non-exposed. Non yeah, the, those countries that are here. The, so the, the countries that are not, not non-exposed, but it's much less exposed compared to the rest. I cannot say that's not exposed, but it's less exposed, low, low exposition. That's the idea, like we are looking at multi-dimension aspects. We're not looking at one as aspect and say, oh, let's sum up. Uh, or create an index where we can sum up uh, external and fiscal and socioeconomic. Because it doesn't make sense. Socioeconomic is one thing. You have different policies to, uh, like uh, social coverage, for example. And the, you have to retrain your workers. In the case of Brazil, you have a lot of workers uh, that depend on these industries. But uh, you have to retrain them. You, have to, you must have a strong social protection system. Or in the case of, I don't know, South Africa, as the same, so, uh, socioeconomic. Or in the case of Algeria, which is this one, you have like high exposition in all dimensions. So it's like both, uh, and it's the thing like. 
Well, Russia is the same, China is the same, it's a country that we're thinking it's uh, about exposition. Well, just to conclude some additional features that we're working, I was, talk I was talking a little bit on the CBAN. What is the CBAN? Carbon bar adjustment mechanism that Europe, Europe countries are discussing to introduce, which is a directly policy, uh, and it's focused on these five products here, aluminum, chemi uh, cement, electricity, fertilizer, and iron and steel. They are looking at this uh, electricity, of course, like uh, the idea of electricity, like, uh, you are charging the electricity from fossil fuels because it's much more emitting than el electricity from uh, green sources. Well, but you are looking at these five industries and you say, okay, China, sorry, <laughs> the Europe will, uh, will charge these products, will have like a contribution, it's not a tax because if it is a tax they cannot and uh, pass through the system, European system, and so on and so forth. But uh, they will charge these industries the same way they charge these industries here in Europe. So the idea is to expand the carbon market from Europe to the rest of the world. Uh, but only, of course, they, they cannot just expand it, uh, but only for the products that enter in Europe. And here, are, here we have the importance of the exports of these countries to Europe in these products. So for example, Russia is the one that will be more impacted in terms of, uh, in absolute terms, like about 10 billion of, uh, of Russian exports are either iron steel, fertilizer, electricity, or aluminum to Europe. So this is something that basically we're using the same tool that we had before, and we are going to look at specific products, not anymore, to generic sectors as we were doing before. We we're looking at this product, the importance of this product for uh, a specific measure. And here what we have is like the importance of this product in terms of the share of their exports. So for example, Mozambique is a country that about 20%, almost 20% of Mozambique exports is aluminum to Europe. So when you in Europe introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism like this, they are I don't know if I can say this word, but uh, Mozambique is like in a very bad position. Uh, <laughs> and the same for Bos Bosnia, Serbia, Ukraine, and uh, North Macedonia. Actually, here uh, the, the Balkan countries are, Balkans countries are most, the most impacted ones, together with Belarus and Mozambique is a special case. It's a very exceptional case. Uh, this, the same thing that we did for the industries there, the, the large industries, we're doing this for specific products. So this is the European CO2 emissions by product, and this is the non-European country CO2 emission by products. And then we look at aluminum, cement, electricity, fertilizer, and iron steel. This is the 10% worth, which is a limit that they are putting. For example, if I'm here, uh, I have this emission here, I will not pay my emissions, I will pay the worst 10% in Europe. But the thing w we want to show here is that we can go much further with the paper that we're doing before. That's why I think it is more a tool than a, tool than, uh, a proper result itself. But we can use these ideas that we have in this paper to look at these countries and see, based on the revenue, what are the countries that have the worst and including indirect impact, they will be impacted the most by the CBAN. Before we were looking at the industries in general, now we are looking at specific measures in Europe with these industries. The, of course, before we have like 30, 40%. Now we are talking about 4% for Moldavia. Moldavia, yeah, I think. 4% uh, of the wages in Moldavia will be impacted by the CBAN, which means that the wage bill will, if they cannot export anymore to Europe because of the CBA, if Europe start buying domestically because of the these mechanisms, 4% of the wages, uh, 4%, there, there will be a drop of 4% in wages in Moldavia. In terms of employment, Bosnia is here, Serbia, so you have some countries that will be much more impacted in terms of employment, but not very well paid uh, jobs, but Ukraine, Moldavia, and Mozambique, Mozambique is here, right? 3.5% uh, of the of this wage, and about 1.5% of the employment will be lost. Are you taking emissions for a given year, a given period? 
it's for 2015, which is the last data we have. But yeah, once you have like there, actually the uh, there are a lot of works recently on these input output tables that we can calculate these uh, for like more recent periods. Like, uh, but where yeah, 2015 is not that far actually if you're thinking about these structural things, like because it's like it's not that Mozambique is now producing cars and not anymore <laughs> aluminium. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not like this, but uh, yeah. But uh, of course, it's an issue like, uh, we have to consider. Well, this is one application of this, this analysis. It's a more direct one because before we were just talking theoretically about sunset industries. Now we're talking about industries that will be indeed affected if the European Union introduced this C ban. It's in discussion, probably it's going to, uh, they will have a decision the last, next uh, three, four months. Well, again, the emission intensity by sector is something that's much more interesting when you're not looking at mining and querying as a general sector. We're looking at production of electricity by coal, production of electricity by oil, uh, petroleum and oil derivatives. So you see that there are a, a huge difference between the, the industries. And here we are considering the backward linkage as well. Like you're considering, like, for example, like uh, uh, cattle farming. Oh, I, th I think processing meat, processing meat, cattle. It's here, like it's a very emitting sector, but it's not the processing meat process that is very emitting. Is the cattle, uh, because it's CO2 equivalent, so is the, the bovines that generate a lot of methane. I don't know. Um, uh, but it's not the processing meat process that's very emitting, but the, for processing meat, you need to produce meat. You need to process it, you need to produce this. And this is an input that is very important to generate this result for the processing it. And then manufacturing of cement is the same. Like to produce cement, you emit a lot. And these are the sectors that the, the industries or products that emit the most. And here, uh, just to finish, like, uh, we are trying to find what are the industries that uh, within these, in these four industries, the four big industries that we're talking, there are some specific products, for example, aluminum, cement, uh, fertilizers. And here, the 45 degree line would be those counters that we are estimating correctly the impact. And the distance here is something that is showing, OK, in the case of Colombia, I don't know where Colombia is here, uh, it means that we are talking about like 50% uh, uh, of 50% uh, yeah 50% of exposure net, uh, for, uh, net foreign exposure, but indeed is not 50. Actually, it's 40. Uh, it's not 40. It's 22. And then using these granulated data, we can refine these results and not work with this mining and querying sector that is, they have everything together, or metal products that you have like uh, very important metals for the ecological transition, for the low carbon transition. Uh, and then now we are talking a little bit more on the effective products. So for each country, it will, di will be different, of course. Very subjective. Uh, how did you come up with the number? Like, this one? Basically, what we did to calculate this is like uh, rather than using this sector as uh, one sector, like uh, looking at all the four sectors that we were talking before, we are looking at specific products within the sector. Mm -hmm. We can do this for uh, foreign exp net raise of foreign exports because we can do the we have this trade data, but the production data is much more complicated. That's why we are not using these for for the, all the paper. Okay, we can d use this for external exposition, but not for the rest of the exposition. Data is being produced, like uh, more and more, like in the next few years, maybe two or three or one, I don't know. They will launch a new database for 189 countries with 163 sectors. It's the AXO base, which is a 163 sectors. Uh, and they will have this data for this. The thing is like, we have this data for we can calculate this very detailed data for the European countries plus 16 largest economies because we have this data. But 
what we want to look at is the African countries, is the Latin American countries, East Asian countries, and these data we don't have for these countries. So the problem is like, it's always like we're fi we like fighting for more data. We are trying to create some methods to. Uh, so we have like uh, what I'm trying to show here is like the two coins, <laughs> the, the two sides of the coin. First, we need uh, we have these these two, and we can apply these for more, like the Seban story or many others. And the other thing is like, when you have like more detailed data, we can have a much better tool. So the, the thing is like, there are a lot of things to do. That's why I told it, okay, it's a paper, it's a finished paper, but under construction, because it's finished, the paper, like we have the two, and now you have to construct, build more things to work more on these to make it more precise, Make it make sure that the results are consistent and everything. Yeah, this is like uh, you can use domestic input output matrices. This is the case of, uh, okay, I didn't put the name here, but it's, uh, let me see. Ah, this is Brazil. Uh, and this is South Africa where you have like a 86, the 96 input output matrix, 96, 96, 96 sector input output matrix. So we can look at the sectors with much more detail. So the thing is, yeah, OK, sorry if I took my time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much again for that presentation. Uh, we, we, we really enjoyed uh, reading through it and, and making some critiques. I'm sorry, we might repeat some of the things uh, that you said and also some of our recommendations based on your paper. You've already started to address them in the additional work you've started to do, which is which is great, and but also frustrating for <laughs> what we did. Um, but uh, the presentation is just going to look at some of the strengths that we identified with the study, uh, look at some of the points that could potentially be developed, some of which you've already started to develop, and then just start to consider policy um, applications, uh, ending at the end with some questions. Um, so essentially, the paper is uh, just providing estimates of countries' macroeconomic exposures to the low carbon tr transition. Um, just to quickly go over this idea of exposure versus vulnerability, which is often misunderstood in, in a lot of uh, 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 literature on uh, the risks of transitions, uh, one way to think about it is uh, a country could be uh, exposed but not vulnerable. Uh, but if a country is vulnerable, then they're necessarily exposed. So if you're, uh, if you're an elite athlete uh, and you go and you injure your ankle, right, um, then your ankle is always uh, exposed uh, to kind of being injured over and over again, as ankle injuries do. But uh, as, as an athlete, you can go and you can do rehabilitation and you can go to gym and you can strengthen the ligaments and the muscles around your ankle so that it's not vulnerable for another injury and you can continue to play uh, for the rest of the seasons. So that's kind of the way that we should understand the difference between exposure and, and vulnerability that countries have. Um, what we really enjoyed about uh, this approach is that the approach kind of moves away from thinking about exposure to the uh, green transition. It moves away from thinking about it in terms of the financial, um, the financial risks and the financial exposure of stranded assets uh, in brown industries or for brown goods. And it starts to think about how is a country exposed uh, in its macroeconomy in other ways, uh, in, in, in social ways, in, in, in terms of production, in its fiscal exposure? How, is a, a, how does this exposure affect a, a country's ability to develop, right? And I think this is a very, very important contribution, especially for, for countries in the developing South. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've, we've been through, through this already. It looks at employment uh, and wages as the social exposure, uh, production, uh, looking at the fiscal exposure from the money that comes through the revenue from brown industries, and exports and balance of payments. Um, this is a very similar table to what you did, but essentially the, the paper just takes the, uh, the green, uh, there's three levels of exposure, external, fiscal, and socioeconomic, and the, the kind of indexes that are used uh, for the socioeconomic, or the social prote protection coverage, the human development index, and for fiscal exposure, the green complexity potential index, and external exposure, uh, also product emission intensity and green complexity index. And it takes all of these three and it combines them into some kind of multi-dimensional exposure. 
Um, and the way that you can think about it is that these are the kind of human development index, uh, 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 emissions, uh, we're taking all these indexes and we're combining them with the classic uh, Leontief input output tables. Um, and then this is something that's already been discussed, so we'll just go past that quickly. Uh, and then a kind of uh, uh, um, a clustering of the countries by these different exposures um, is, is how it ends. Um, our, our considerations of points to develop uh, mostly have to do with measurement. Um, the first thing is, of course, uh, we acknowledge that macroeconomic exposure is, is a difficult thing to measure in a lot of ways. It requires measuring the capacity of a country to uh, adopt its productive sectors, which comes at so high social costs. But also, understanding this risk means understanding uh, the institutions of a country. Uh, the ability of an institution, uh, of a country's institution, to protect it from being vulnerable uh, and to protect those exposures, to go to the gym and make sure you're, you're exercising that ankle, you know, uh, that ability requires institutions and uh, it's difficult to measure how well institutions can allow you to protect your exposures. Um, there's some ways that you could do it. Um, for example, the index of state weakness, looking at state institutions. You could look at uh, historical evidence. You could look at the, the policy objectives of a given country uh, to protect its exposures. But all of these, again, have, have a lot of problems. Uh, the index of state weakness is, is very uh, kind of, it's like, it's a very broad and kind of fuzzy index. It uh, doesn't really get to the point all the time. Historical uh, evidence is very difficult because you really have to do in-depth research on every single country, which makes it difficult to do all of that work at once and then look at interrelations between countries, uh, like it's done with the input-output tables. And it's very taxing and, and laborious work. And then green transformation policy objectives, you know, you, you can't really measure uh, 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 countries' institutions by its objectives. Uh, it's like measuring a person's successes by uh, how good their, their New Year's resolutions are. It doesn't really explain how strong the institutions are. Um, and then the, the second thing is uh, we thought that could uh, be developed is looking at uh, social, the social variables of, this, uh, of the composition of, of, of your study uh, just by wages and employment. Uh, there's definitely a, a range of other ways that you can uh, look at how a, how a society is socially exposed to the ecological transition. Um, things like looking at the exposure to natural disasters that lead to displacement, migration, and a whole range of social political hardships. Um, if things like this aren't, aren't being considered, uh, I think that if there are, for example, natural disasters, that exposure wouldn't be accounted for uh, in the study that, 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 that has been undertaken. Uh, and then also um, the, the existing gender uh, inequalities uh, and those structural social factors um, will be intensified by, by crises if, if, um, if the transition doesn't take them into account. So potentially introducing the gender inequality index and the natural risk index into the, the consideration of the socioeconomic uh, variables could be a valuable uh, contribution in, in our view. Um, then the second problem with, uh, with measurement is uh, one that you've actually started to, to deal with um, but these are, these are kind of two ad additional, additional points. The first is the risk of being at risk. Um, and this is like a, not a time one, time two, but a time three risk, right? Where by the study doesn't measure the risk that, uh, for example, um, maybe not currently, but as uh, uh, many European and Western economies offshore the, 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 the ecologically damaging production and consumption patterns uh, onto uh, developing countries, there is a risk that, that in the coming years, in order to meet the objectives, these uh, more developed countries offshore their brown production onto, developed, uh, onto developing countries. Um, and this is like an impending risk. Uh, it's an impending potential exposure that could come at a later stage in the decades to come. And I think that by, by considering this, the, the, the consideration of overall risk in the future would be better served. Um, and then the other, the, other, the, the last thing on the, an issue with 
with measurement uh, is around, uh, at some point in the paper it was mentioned that transport and electricity aren't considered sunset industries because they have the, the potential to transform into green industries. Um, and I mean, if, if you could say that about the two industries that are probably the biggest contributors to green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, you could probably say that about any single product. You could probably say that about keys as well, right? You could, you could potentially transform uh, uh, any good into being more sustainable and, and ecologically friendly. So to think about it in terms of sunset industries might not be so useful. And the turn to looking from sunset industries to sunset products I is way more valuable. And uh, it's great that, that that work has already started and, and, and it looks really uh, exciting. Um, next, Eloisa will discuss some of the policy implications of, of the study. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Professor Magasu. Uh, well, now that Kamal addressed some of the results and met methods of the study, I will try to talk about uh, policy application. We have thought of two uh, fields that this type of measurement that the study uh, created could be applied. One is international development cooperation and the other is international trade. We are going to explain that, but first uh, let's think a bit of the background. Uh, why is that the developing countries are in a different position regarding the transition when you compare them to uh, developed countries? So we have seen by the literature review in the article uh, that there are three uh, main differences, main challenges uh, that the developing countries face macroeconomically. So we need to think about the balance of payment constraints, we need to th think about path dependency in the fiscal side and also of negative distributional effects on the social side. Um, I will not like go extensively on that because we already saw this, but balance of payment uh, constraints due to the fact that these countries need to rise foreign currency to import goods, uh, capital goods and inputs from uh, global north countries that actually produce these technologies, green technologies. Uh, also because they are going to face uh, drops in their exports revenues due to their dependency on sunset industry. And path dependency, uh, it's also about that. It's about the fact that the governments uh, will face uh, drops in their fiscal revenues uh, in the upcoming years since they are more uh, dependent directly or indirectly in these declining industries. Negative distributional effects should be taken into consideration because transition policies, they almost always have an impact directly in employment and wages uh, and in the welfare uh, of the society as a, as a whole. Uh, on the long term, this, is, uh, this effect is supposed to be uh, better more positive, but in the short term it is definitely uh, negative. So uh, policies should address this with uh, increasing social spendings and amplifying the social protection coverage as a whole. So as we see, uh, governments will need to make lots of money and raise lots of foreign currency and spend this money. And how do a developing country or a country as a whole what are the instruments it has traditionally to increase its financing? We can think of two streams of financing instruments, internal and external. Internal side, like very broadly, we can think of fiscal policy and monetary policy. We already saw that fiscal policy has several constraints. So monetary policy also has constraint, special constraints for developing countries. We can think of the fact that developing countries have a limited access to green finance due to the fact that green finance is very uh, intensive in capital. Uh, also, there is the fact of the international monetary system being very hierarchical and in a detrimental way for, the, uh, for developing countries to access credit. Uh, but let's take a look on the external side and this is where we could think of an application of the measurements the study provides. So what are four uh, important um, financing instruments? We have private capital flows, we have migrant remittances, international development cooperation, and also international trade. So private capital flows, they regard basically foreign direct investments. 
uh, the, the study uh, actually addresses this as a possibility of extension of the research uh, of um, incorporating uh, measurements of uh, FDI in future, um, in future uh, estimates of the macroeconomic exposure. But uh, we should think like in a context that we are right now, like since the 2008 crisis, FDI has been in a drop. Uh, and also FDI is very linked to the perception that international investors have on the developing countries. Uh, so uh, there is a global dynamics at play that's not like something that the countries can do only domestically, only by their, themselves. So it is um, it's a tricky channel uh, to assess. Also, we have migrant remittances. Like migrant remittances, they do not reach the scale of, uh, of uh, that the transition will require to take place, of course. But they are very important for some developing countries. They could be assessed in a future index as well. But uh, the literature actually is very ambiguous about the effects of uh, migrant remittances. Uh, if the effects are actually good or bad for the development of countries, due to the fact that uh, people migrate generally because they face uh, hard, uh, hardships in the economic conditions in their home countries, and remittances may be linked uh, to the poverty of the original country, and it's not very clear if uh, improving remittances, like policy to boost remittances, would be something that would uh, be good for a country or not. So the most promising instruments to, to address here should be these ones, uh, international development cooperation and international trade. The good thing about them is that they, um, uh, there are several commitments and there are several rules, there are several aspects of international governance that could be reformed in order to improve uh, the access of developing countries should this finance. Uh, international development cooperation, just to review, uh, we can divide it by north-south cooperation and south-south cooperation. Uh, by the north-south cooperation, we could think of institutions such as the World Bank and could think about the OECD countries that are donors of aid, uh, which is the um, official uh, development assistance, ODA. Uh, actually, these countries, they have a commitment since the 70s to direct 0.7% uh, of their gross uh, national income to developing countries in the form of aid, uh, also in infrastructure investments and also in technology sharing. And this commitment is never reached. It's, around, it's always around the average of that, uh, 0, 0.3, 0, 0.35. And it's something that it's actually reinforced by the Sustainable Development Goals. It is Sustainable Development Goal 17. Uh, it's something that could be pressed. And uh, one interest aspect is that the loans and the direction of these resources of ODA, they are linked to income criteria uh, mostly. Like they only see the, the level of income of each country they divide the countries by groups, and each group has diff different conditions to assess a uh, old uh, loan, a loan of the World Bank, and so on. So we'll talk about this uh, in a minute. Uh, let's just uh, define a, uh, very quickly South-South cooperation. We can think also of um, regional banks. We can think of BRICS banks, ba or agreements of trade, or agreements of technology sharing between developing countries. This is very promising, but it's also a field that has been very dominated by China. And uh, we should also f uh, take a closer look if, this, uh, this is, um, this, if the dynamics of the soft-soft cooperation is not underplaying an, uh, a new type of hierarchy of the credit, international credit system. Uh, but it's also like a possibility to fund the transition. And the last one is the international trade, of course. Uh, there are a set of rules at the World Trade Organization, WTO, that could be changed in order to uh, improve the access of the countries to the technology and the resources to do the transition. And this is where we would suggest the, apl the application of such an, in an index, like the exposure to the low-carbon transition. Uh, 
uh, an index like that could orient, like a, it could be the criteria also to orient uh, cooperation loans given by older donors or multilateral uh, de uh, development banks, for instance. Like it could be combined with the income cut criteria and uh, give some priority to countries that are more vulnerable to the transition than others. Also, we could think of uh, such an index being applied to advocate for WTO special provisions. Uh, WTO has special provisions for some goods and some countries, especially least developed, developed countries. So we could think of this criteria of the most vulnerable ones uh, uh, to the transition also being a special provision in the WTO or even um, a differentiation differentiation condition in the trips agreement because there is also like the um, directs of pro uh, intellectual property that are very important also in climate um, related technologies and we could think of a special conditions to access those uh, and also even waivers uh, there are some there are some authors like this one um, uh, this uh, South African author of the jurist, uh, uh, the jurist publication, it advocates like to use the momentum of the vaccine waiver to actually advocate also for a climate waiver. Well, we could think of uh, using uh, a measurement like that to support such um, such uh, arguments as well. So. After these suggestions, we would like to address two questions to Professor Magasho to start the discussion. The first one, um, regarding the measurement of countries' macroeconomic exposure to the low carbon transition, the presentation outlines possible problems related both to the social variables and the aggregation variables, uh, and the aggregation methods. Well, do you also think those are problems, and if so, uh, how do you think we could uh, overcome them? You already addressed some lines of future research, but if you have uh, some other thoughts to share, we would like to hear it. And a second question, uh, it's about policy application. The suggestions that we make here regarding international cooperation and international trade through these institutions such as ODA, World Bank, the WTO, uh, do you think these policy suggestions make sense? And if so, what are the steps for them to be implemented? So that's, that's it for now. Thank you for the attention. Uh, well, thank you very much for the comment. A very, very deep read. I'll take this off, sorry. A <laughs> uh, very deep reading. It's like... Uh, I think that there are a lot of things that you said uh, that we are working on, and there are a lot of things that you said that, okay, we should work on because <laughs> like, uh, it's definitely very important. Like, uh, thank you very much for it. I would talk a little bit on, I uh, have some points that I, I listed here, and trying to answer the questions. Well, first, the discussion about the institutions. I completely agree that institutions are very important, but uh, I, uh, I have a problem with the lit institutional literature because it's like, it's, uh, I know that there are a lot of improvements recently, but there are kind of uh, like uh, over, it's uh, like uh, I would say that uh, maybe we are over worried about the institutions as if they will save the world and we are not thinking about how to build these institutions. And to build institutions, we need policy. To build institutions, we need to think about, like, for example, uh, vulnerabilities. To, because it's like institutions are not created from, from scratch. Like, they are produced. They are socially produced. So it's like, uh, uh, and then we have to understand, like, why like, all the countries that are developed today are, have good institutions. Or it's the opposite. Like, they, are, they have good institutions because it's there. So it's these indigenous in the discussions, like, always the thing that matters, like, uh, uh, I, I don't know, the indices for institutions, I, I really like the literature, the literature is like, uh, but the indices that they pr start producing, the World Bank and transparency, blah, blah, that even the World Bank is not producing anymore, uh, it's something that 
it's very complicated how they are produced because like uh, there are a lot of bias and a lot of so using these I think is I would say that uh, the idea I completely agree with you that it's important to have it in mind, but the use of these indices, I think it's complicated. I think there is a very nice paper that's uh, discussed about the policy and institutions, what, what matters the most, like policy or institutions, how one creates the other. Like policy is very important <laughs> and institutions are very important. But it's, the, it's, it's something that we can go, like, uh, can talk like this, about this, like, uh, one year, and you're not reaching some conclusions because the institutions are produced socially. And uh, yeah, well, and apart from these, uh, uh, the rest of the things that you said, I, I completely agree with everything. Like uh, we can, like, uh, I'm, first of all, socio-economic. Uh, the only problem that we face to have these is because it's complicated. <laughs> to look at socioeconomic beyond wages and employment. It's the only problem because like we have to, first the data is not good. We start having some very interesting sectoral data on employment, wage, uh, uh, employment and wage by gender, which is very interesting because you can say, okay, these industries, who works for these industries? Uh, and who are, who is being affected? More men, men or women? Uh, in terms of the vulnerability, like it's uh, more uh, the wage of these women uh, that are being affected is the lower uh, wa low wages, and so we are generating employment in those that need the most of this employment. So it's interesting to go through these. It's something that needs to be done because if we're thinking about the vulnerabilities, uh, we, can, we need to go beyond the. Uh, we need to go through these structural aspects, like the uh, gender aspects, or even the. Uh, you have also some data on wages and employment by uh, and years of studies, some like low skilled, high skilled labor. And it's interesting to see, because sometimes just looking at wages, I say, okay, you are just trying high. Uh, 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 employments that well paid jobs, like uh, jobs that uh, pay the most. But sometimes the, you are destroying employments of those that need the most of these employments and they are not, those that are, doesn't have any other option in life than these jobs. So it's like, it's much more important than uh, I think. It's much more important than, that's definitely very important to look at the social aspects. Uh, and go beyond the employment and wage because this is not socioeconomic. Maybe this is economic and it's not social, but it's like, uh, unfortunately, the data for this is, again, we're starting having these data now, sectoral data, because we have the, like, women employed, uh, unemployment, uh, men unemployment, but uh, sectorally, uh, especially for these countries that we're talking about, developing countries, is very difficult. We have for European countries, we have for OECD countries in general, but not for these countries. But actually, it's interesting because like we are putting pressure on the need for this data. At some point, like uh, data are produced, or uh, actually data are produced, but uh, they are produced with a name. If the, if you look at these and say, okay, we need this data, and I have to calculate these and to show these results, and then to move to, uh, towards more specific information about the socioeconomic problems. Uh, there is a pressure for ILO, for example, we can do a co collaboration of ILO, with ILO to produce this, this information, to have it more detailed. So it's definitely very interesting, very important. I completely agree with you that uh, the social aspects are important and, and need to go further beyond the things that we're saying here. Uh, it's different, for example, taxation or uh, foreign exchange because it's like, it's something given by the socioeconomics, much more, I'd say, uh, multi-dimensional <laughs> within the socioeconomic, the socioeconomic, you have to look at this uh, from a multi-dimensional perspective. Well, uh, on the disaggregation and the discussion about electricity and transport, uh, there is, maybe it's not clear in the paper, but there is something that, uh, okay, transport is a service. Uh, electricity is a product. Uh, <coughs> you can produce the same services and the same products in very different ways, and those that are using will never know the, how they are produced 
or maybe they, in the case of transport. But uh, here, I don't know if this electricity is from nuclear. I know because all, for almost all energy inference is from nuclear sources, but uh, it's electricity. It's like a, it's a product. But the thing is like how you produce this product. So uh, it's different than the other uh, things that we're saying here. That's like uh, you have to change this. Uh, there will be a change in the preferences. There will be a change in the demand for the products. Like you start consuming less meat and more vegetables. You are uh, building houses with less concrete, with, which is something that produces a lot of CO2. We are building houses with less, uh, I don't know, iron and with more wood. I don't know if this, you have to take care of about the deforestation too, but uh, uh, it's another story that's going beyond low carbon transition and going through the biodiversity discussion. But the thing is like, uh, when you're talking about transport and electricity, why we're not considering electricity or transport here as sunset industries? Because it's not electricity itself that will be replaced, but the way you're producing electricity is different, for example, than meat. It's meat that will be re replaced. So you have a, 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 structure, a structural change in the final demand. In the case of electricity, you're not changing the demand for electricity. You're Actually, you're increasing the demand for electricity because you are now needing uh, cars, electric cars. Actually, the, on the base of the decarbonization is like um, massive electrification which is like basically replacing the other source to electricity and decarbonization of electricity. So it's ha we have to do the two things at the same time. Like uh, it's a parallel thing. Like it's not enough to have only massive electrification if you're producing electricity from coal. But you need to promote this massive electrification to stop using uh, fossil fuels, for example, to, uh, as, as cars from full propensity cars. So it's like or uh, start using more public transportation based on electricity. Like, uh, I don't know, bus here, are electricity, metro, and everything. Well, so it's more about like the product. Uh, that's the difference between the product and the inputs. Like, uh, uh, of course, like if you have data for saying, okay, there is two types of products, electricity from fossil fuels, like the, the last thing that I show you. You have electricity from coal, petroleum, gas, and electricity from uh, solar voltaic energy. Okay, you, if you have this sector disaggregated, you can look at them separately and say, okay, all the assets that you have to produce, stranded assets that you have to produce and, uh, these uh, electricity from coal, fossil fuels, those countries that produce this electricity are much more exposed those than those countries that produce electricity from, fo from photovoltaic energy. I completely agree with you. But there is this difference between products and how you produce the products and how you... If we have these disaggregations, the best of the world, like we have these, and once you have these, we can look at them separate, but it's uh, the other thing is more like, okay, the, I, don't, I don't believe that we have these for transportation in the next 10 years, 20 years, like maybe 20, but data from like type of transportation by sector, I don't think we have. Electricity, we start having, we start having like, I don't know if I trust in this data, but <laughs> it's another story. But uh, well, and, and then I completely agree with you. Like, uh, socioeconomic and the disaggregation is like is the next like next step on the, like going further and going beyond and going deep into this this discussion uh, about the vulnerability that you. you talk a little bit on the offshore, like it's we, actually it's very related to the FDI and the, those like uh, they talk. Uh, the CBAN story is a little bit on this, like what they are doing. They are trying to prevent the European countries to offshore the CO2 emissions. Like what, what the idea is like, okay, you're charging also the imports, uh, European imports of uh, cement, uh, aluminum, iron steel, uh, fertilizer and electricity uh, because what happened in the last 10 20 years is that European countries they they did it they offshore the the co2 like uh, is the pollution uh, heaven pollution hypothesis I think uh, is the idea that okay you have a very restrictive policy in your country what the what is gonna happen like there will be a lot of investment in the surrounding countries or the partners 
to uh, start with uh, start with this and then the policies now are in this direction in the direction of like reducing the uh, the uh, the emissions embodied in consumption the emissions embodied in inputs like uh, why they and maybe they will do this in a few years but maybe they will start uh, charging or like uh, <laughs> having like tax it's not a tax, but a tax, uh, taxing uh, the meat, the, because they know that meat is the w one of the products that consume the most. Of the Actually, it's very complicated because it's the CO2, but also the biodiversity and it's also the deforestation. And so, uh, well, but yeah, I completely agree with you that we, we, we have to look at these because maybe the countries are becoming more and more vulnerable. Another thing that you talked about the natural disasters, I think this one is the more complicated one, but it's very interesting too, because the basically you have to invert the logic. Because basically we're thinking now about like, you have a policy that is affecting industries differently because, uh, and then those industries that are more impacted will be those, th those countries that depend more, more on these industries will be the most impacted. When you're talking about the natural disasters or even the uh, climate change impacts, we are talking what are the industries that will be more impacted, which are not necessarily those industries that uh, are the CO2 intensive industries, like vegetable, like uh, I don't know. Uh, there are we just developed the it in uh, just published the we just published the uh, book on Vietnam and the Mekong, which is the region that, uh, where the Vietnam and some other countries are, uh, Laos, Cambodia, and yeah. I don't know exactly how it is, but uh, yeah. And the discussion is exactly about this. Like uh, we have the other side of the coin. Like uh, one is like the policy to reduce will impact these industries. And the other is like, if you don't do these policies, those industries will be the, the most impacted. And rice, it has nothing to do with the, actually it's a very carbon intensive industry, but rice will be the most, one of the industries that will be the most impacted. So it's, it's like, it's changing the, the way we're looking, but it's also very important. Like to look at this sectorial dependence according to the risk of natural disasters. And then social, socially as well, like uh, who works in these industries? Uh, probably very poor people that depend a lot on these uh, the impact will be insane for these people, so it's like, well, so it's like uh, you brought like very interesting points on these, like uh, I completely agree with you that we, there are like a huge way to discuss on these. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes you have to decide to finish something. <laughs> you cannot just like keep writing, writing, writing. Uh, otherwise, I could like write for this and study this forever. And but sometimes, like uh, it's important to say, okay, this one is finished, and then we start the other one. And um, yeah, and yeah, also to show to the others for the others to do something because uh, we cannot do everything alone. So it's like it's possible to have people who are interested on these and going beyond this. Well, uh, the policy application, yeah. Um, I really think that the, the policy suggestions, they do make sense because like, uh, I, I really think that this is the point, like uh, when you're talking about developing countries vulnerabilities, you're not saying that, okay, the countries are vulnerable and forgot, forgot them, like they were not, uh, uh, the slow carbon transition will not work. It's not like this. Of course, that uh, when you first look at this, you say, okay, it's not gonna work because uh, if you had, uh, actually I presented this paper in the COP26 last year, and people were looking at me and saying, like uh, it was virtual, but uh, they are looking at me and say, what is this guy talking about? That uh, what, everything that we're talking here is irrelevant because like we are talking about green bones, Finance, uh, all this green finance thing, and we, uh, they are saying that green bonds will save the world. Uh, but okay, but it's a very north perspective. If you're looking at the south, the story is completely different because, like, we're just saying that basically we should look a little bit at the south countries and say, okay, if they will not have access to green, green, green finance, not in the traditional way. Maybe they will have access through uh, multilateral institutions like the new developing bank or like 
but not in the, they will not access the American or the European green bonds market. They will not. It has to be through other ways. And this is the point. The, the cooperation between countries is important. If, they, uh, if you expect that these countries, like those that we're saying here, like uh, Algeria, which is not the worst in terms of like, uh, vulnerabilities, it's the, in terms of exposition it is, but in terms of vulnerabilities, it's not. Uh, if you're talking about these countries, basically the, the access they, they have to financial markets, international financial markets, is very limited. So basically the products that we are developing here in the north to deal with the low carbon transition is very focused on the problems that the north face uh, and not the problems that the south is facing. But the low carbon transition will not happen in the north and not in the south. It has to happen in the world as a whole. So like, uh, I, I, I really think that like, what you brought from the, the discussion on cooperation, uh, I will be very honest with you, I'm not a very big, um, I, um, I don't know too much about this. That's why I'm like talking about uh, in circles <laughs> and not being very deep into the point. But I really think that that's the point. Like, we are trying to show the importance of this. And then we need people who work on this to go and say, okay, how to do this? How to bring this, uh, all these finance uh, instruments that we are developing in the north to the south? How to move to the south? Uh, yeah, go ahead.